Good afternoon or good evening if you're watching from Europe. Um, I think people who've been watching the show for some time understand the basic concept of the format. Uh, I get to talk to um, analysts, I get to talk to officials, um, and they will give a you know share with me uh, their opinion about um, events that are making news. Uh, it's it's rare to have an opportunity, however, to speak to an actual news maker, and um, today we have a unique opportunity to do just that. Uh, the story of Victor Bout is known to almost everybody now, if only because he was the man who was exchanged for Miss um, Grenier, the, uh, the the WNBA basketball star who had been uh, arrested and imprisoned in Russia. Um, and if you read the headlines in the United States, uh, she was exchanged for this notorious individual, a man who was a gun runner, a, uh, you know, somebody who wanted to kill Americans, et cetera, imprisoned uh, in, in the United States. And we, we exchanged this for Ms. Grenier. Um, well, that's one side of the story. Here we have an opportunity to get the other side of the story, which will enable everybody in the listening audience, hopefully to get the, the full story. So, um, I want to welcome uh, Victor Boat to the show. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for for agreeing to be here. Um, I know you've gone through a very trying experience, um, and I, I want to be respectful of that. Uh, but I do think we need to, you know, talk about some issues to to clear the air. So, um, thank you very much. Let's let's just start from the the beginning. You were arrested in two thousand and eight in Thailand uh, as part of a, a DEA, a Drug Enforcement Agency, sting. Um, can you walk us through, from your perspective, what happened in Thailand, and then how did you get from there to a courtroom in the United States? Uh, good evening, Scott. It's nice to talk to you, and thank you for giving these opportunities, uh, especially at this you know, time and day where we're all facing a severe danger of the full world extermination. Because those crazy politicians, especially from the White House, are pushing us closer and closer to the nuclear Armageddon. Well, you know, Thai's story is very simple. First of all, I was doing my business uh, in Africa and the Middle East mainly, and never have anything to do or any somehow harm any American interest. More uh, over going uh, and or conspire with somebody to go and to kill Americans in Colombia. This is a magic glue. You know, those magicians from the Southern District of New York uh, and the uh, U.S. attorney using to stick you and get you life sentence, you know, nothing works better than to bring to the pool of jurors in the Southern District of New York, majority of them, you know, very well are liberals and they are freshly meant mint Americans. So whatever, you know, you just, you know, show them one finger and they say, you know, uh, what to do. If you tell them to jump, they're going to ask you how high we have to jump. That's actually what's happened. That's why even my, you know, presiding judge, you know, even on the sentencing told, look, he's a businessman, you're not really committing any crime, but she forced to, you know, follow the guideline and give me 25 years, which is, you know, Ridiculous. For what? For the thought crime? Because I was sitting with the undercover agents and they charged me with a conspiracy? What DAA have to do with this case? I never been involved in any drug trade. For me, it's very simple. On the trial, Scott, you would not believe it. They have to disclose how much they spent. And they spent just to catch me $150 million. These two dupe uh, bloody uh, undercover agents, you know, one is a Mexican, another Guatemalan. They've got, uh, from my case, like eight to one was eight, another $10 million of taxpayers' money. So the DA spent $150 million to frame me, to catch me, and spend for what? Couple trips to Europe, one trip to the Thailand? Give me the break. It's all about, you know, a siphoning money from the taxpayers. That's why America now is a nice, good, shining apple eaten inside for the, you know, bunch of the worms until the only shell is left. This is, you know, in a nutshell to tell you what's really happened. And then I was not even extradited. Thai court never even finished with me. 
I still had a hearing there. And what they did, director of that jail where they hold me, because uh, Americans only got three days, even these three days, extradition uh, transfer would not happen. And it wouldn't happen because court says, listen, we still have a hearing with this gentleman because uh, appeal court ruled uh, wrongly because they couldn't change facts of the case. The only facts of the case in Thailand are established by the you know first uh, court, uh, trial court, not the appeal court. The appeal court has to check whether all procedures have been followed up. And now think of this, appeal court was gathered when the Thailand went into the lockdown for three weeks because they have this riot and attempt of revolution, if you remember. And then exactly in the same time when the entire city was burning and literally in the smoke, apparently three judges who are not even supposed to be in this panel ruled that I has to be extradited. The judge, the my judge who actually wrote, uh, read that uh, decision said immediately to my lawyer, uh, do urgent appeal to the Supreme Court. We we qualified that Supreme Court hear this case, and they accepted my appeal. What Americans are doing? They immediately sent another extradition request. Now trying to charge me uh, with some wire fraud, apparently because some purchase of some airplane went wrong somewhere in the world. So uh, guess what? Later on, they dropped that case. Yeah, but they stick to this one. And they knew that this, and in the trial, all this agent been called uh, several times lying to the judges. Same in Thailand, same here. And guess what? Nothing can, you know, stop them to achieving what they want. Finally, they've got their $150 million deal out of this. After me and before me, they went exactly same scenario, same indictment. Everything same, another 12 people on exactly like a, you know, travel circus show, you know, traveling from one city to another, doing exactly the same. Then they retired and now they're traveling to giving the lectures. How good they are of the law enforcement. How many of the, you know, bad guys they call. How strong they help American security. Yeah, right. And no, then, uh, look, when you, Victor, you're, 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 you know, there is no defense from conspiracy charges in America. So it doesn't matter what you say or how you do or which appeal you do. Oh, you know, this is a bad Russian. By that time, demonization of me already started. I was a character of that, you know, Nicholas Cage, even on trial. When judge asked the agent, what you know about Victor? Oh, they said, very simple. We watched that movie. We read that book. Do you have a Russian interpreter in your team? No, we, we only had the Spanish, that's enough. And this is a quality investigative job of DAA. It's a, it yeah. looks like a joke. I, I think it's important to uh, step back just a second and remind the audience about what was going on in 2008, 2009, 2010, because that, that was the period that we're talking about here. <clears throat> um, the United States was engaged in a policy of regime change in Russia, where they were actively trying to um, keep Vladimir Putin from coming back into office uh, after he did the swap with uh, Dmitry Medvedev. And a key aspect of this uh, was the demonization of all things Russia, uh, the, the, to engender Russophobia in the minds of the American people. And to do that, they needed a bad guy. You became the bad guy. You became the symbol of everything that's bad about Russia, everything that's evil about Russia, why Russia can't be trusted. Now, they can't tell that story honestly because, you know, the, the reality is um, in the United States, we have a saying, you may have heard this, uh, that we can indict a, uh, a ham sandwich, meaning that a prosecutor could go before a judge and they can indict a ham sandwich. Um, you unfortunately became the ham sandwich for Russophobia, uh, and you were brought in. You know, I don't know the details of your business life, and I don't need to. It's that's your business. It's not my business. The question here is: Were you guilty of the charges that were proffered against you, and were you given a fair defense? And uh, when you have a judge, and I've read her since then. She's now retired, and she's spoken out, uh, and she said that. 
she had no choice. She had to sentence you to 25 years because the jury found you guilty of the crimes. But she said if she had been given the opportunity, she wouldn't have sentenced you to that to that thing because the crimes you were co- accused of committing, what you what the case they even made against you didn't fit the, the sentencing guidelines. And as you pointed out, and I've read your lawyer's appeals, um, you know, he said they never made the case. And I and I believe it. I mean, I've looked at the material superficially. I'm not a lawyer, but um, I don't believe they made the case beyond a reasonable doubt to, to send. There's too many inconsistencies in the case, too many contradictions. Uh, they were caught in too many lies. You know, the, the old saying of one lie, all lie should apply. And so when you have a DE agent on the stand or a witness and they lie, that means you must dismiss everything they say. But again, this was the Southern District of New York. They never lose a case. And they um, you, you unfortunately got caught in, in the middle of it. So I, I think you know, your, 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 your story is extraordinarily important for a couple of reasons. One, as an American, I think it's important that we continue to expose the fact that our justice system is anything but. It's not a system of justice. It's a system of uh, government domination, that if the government wants to send a signal, wants to, uh, to shape opinion, they will pick somebody and they will use that person as a guinea pig to make the case. You, unfortunately, I believe, or the guinea pig for America trying to paint Russia in the worst possible light to create a demon figure, a bad guy to promote Russophobia. And it's a tragedy because what people don't understand, and I know I don't want to dig into this too much, um, but you lost how many years of your life in the American prison system? A lot. You spent a lot of time. So it was 14 years and nine months. Yeah. I mean, and I I hope everybody listening here understands that you sacrificed 14 years and nine months of your life and more than that, because remember you were detained in in Thailand in 2008. uh, And so you lost that period too. For what? For a political, a show, a political show designed to create shape public perception. You're a victim of the war of propaganda that took place. I'll ask you just simple quick. How many Americans have you killed? Zero. The answer is none. Yeah. How many Americans have you plotted to kill? kill? No, no one in my life. Yeah. I don't kill. Right. No one this in is my, my life. point. And I'm not intended but to you're, Yeah. But you're the most evil man in the world, according to the American press. Um, and, and, and this well, is wrong. Um, to the mm-hmm. Pardon? Yeah, according to the bite of all the, you know, so-called Hollywood, you know, and media, you know, complex. No, I, I, I agree. And so, you know, look, my heart breaks about this story because I know what it's like to go to prison falsely accused. I only spent three years away from my family. You spent 14 years, nine months. And I'm trying to impart to the audience how devastating that is. I mean, we look at you today, you're free, but you lost 14 years, nine months. You have a family you didn't get to see for that period of time. I don't want to get into the prison experience, except to ask this. Um, was it a, uh, a just system? Were you treated humanely or was it something different? I mean, you don't have to get into the details, but just roughly speaking, uh, they put you away for 14 years nine months did they treat you as a human being or did they treat you as an animal well it's you know in mcc they treat you like an animal like a you know a wild you know uh animal uh three man hold uh and all kind of the stuff and tense out it's a most inhumane i guess you know lock up in the world and I was very glad that the MCC was shut down finally for everything happened there. And I do believe, you know, American people sooner or later will do investigation about your justice system and persecute those who organize it and run it that way. About USP Marion is a different story. I've been treated fairly there because there is a, you know, professional who do the job there. And I try to stick to certain rule of respect and i have a lot of respect 
to those correctional officers who had been in a USP Marion. I had no problem, and I was, as I told you, was treated fairly over there. Despite they attempt something for the prisoners, the system is set up such that it's becoming a whitewash. It's a weary housing of the people, waste of human beings, and just, you know, killing people's life and time of doing nothing, of not being productive members. There is no any meaningful rehabilitation program or vocational training program. All that is just, you know, whitewash to pass new budget. And by the way, let me tell you, most of the time in uh, USP Marion, I was kept in so-called communication management unit. Communication management unit was not controlled by BOP. It was controlled by CTU. That's another it's a very strange creature. And guess what? The budget for this CMU uh, inmate was uh, uh, close to $1 million a year, while in BOP, the budget is about what now? 39, 42, whatever is latest figure you can check in a federal uh, bulletin, you know, they publish every year. So somebody again prepared a nice uh, scheme how embezzled the money from the taxpayers. That's another, you know, I want again to bring attention. Look, everywhere you touch in America, and American administration bureaucrats are great to organize a perfect, you know, corruption scheme. They always figure pointing in other countries, there is a corruption there, there is a corruption there, but they are master champions of the fraud, corruption, embezzlement, and the waste of the taxpayers' money. That's exactly what's happening. Yes, the staff was, you know, trying their best, you know, in USP Marion to try to do, you know, majority of them are, let me tell you openly, they support normal, you know, family values. They support Trump. They are, you know, pro, uh, in a good sense, Second Amendment and so on. So we have a decent, good relation with the majority of the CEOs, and I was always treated fairly. I can't say anything, you know, than that. But overall system, I guess, if nothing was done very soon, you know, you guys, it's all remembers me the last years of Soviet Union, when, you know, it's a lot of talk, it's a lot of problem out of blue, and nothing does absolutely nothing about that. Um, without giving away, you know, anything that shouldn't be given away, what kind of support did you get from the Russian government while you were uh, incarcerated? Did, uh, were your family able to connect with you? Did the Russian government support you? Uh, or, or were you left to your own devices? Well, I was uh, surprised that the Russian government from get-go, almost from the day, day I was arrested in the Thailand, you know, counselors came and visited. They provided whatever assistance they can. There is was a regular visit. They tried uh, their way in Thailand to, you know, return me back home. It's failed. Then in New York, I was always been visited by the consular workers. Embassy was very kind. Even ambassador visit me, visited me. There is was a regular visits from the guys. Uh, they even subscribed me for the Russian newspapers for all that years, which is also significant, you know, effort from their side, and I'm very appreciative for that. How about your family? Were you able to uh, be in contact with your family? Yes, there is a uh, BOP runs that, uh, you know, telephones, you can call your family. Uh, basically, that's fine, except that in this CMU, Communication Management Unit, you're only able to do two calls a week, 15 minutes each, and you have to sign up uh, like two weeks before for the slot of the time when you're going to call them. And if you miss it or phones down, it's your uh, problem. They don't reschedule it anymore. So this is a very, in my opinion, very stupid. If it's communication management unit, I, uh, you would think that the guys would be giving, you know, at least enough opportunity to communicate, and they're going to check with whom you communicated. No, it's opposite. It's only name. They're never interested really to do nothing. In this communication management, there is no any programs. Nobody talks to you. Nobody does anything about it. It's just, you know, keeping you there. It's like warehouse, human warehouse. Yeah, no, the, the, the tragedy. Um, question I have for you is uh, 
What did um, what was it like when you found out you're going to be released? I mean, when did you find out you're going to be released, and uh, how were you prepared for for that? Well, with all this uh, brouhaha, what was happening in American media, uh, you know, after the Britney Griner was sentenced, it was clear that, you know, something going to happen. Only thing I didn't know when. So I was surprised, but not, uh, you know, completely surprised. I was expecting that something like that can happen. They came uh, early in the morning, about four o'clock. They brought up the boxes. So they tell me, Pak, you were living with all your stuff. I packed my stuff. And when, uh, you know, marshals show up to pick me up, again, city, you intervened and to say, hey, he can't get his uh, thing. So they send me without my, you know, books, my legal paper, you know, uh, my photos. I only received them, you know, two days ago. And still, you know, something is missing. Like they never sent me my tablet, which I purchased. And it's my, per you know, property. And with all my MP3 songs there, you know, looks like, uh, you know, uh, your famous right for your personal property are not anymore applicable in America. You know, they're just stealing the, your stuff. And there is no accountability for that. How were you received when you came home? Uh, when, when you arrived back in Russia, how, how, how did the Russian government receive you? I, I'm sure your family received you very happily, but uh, the, how about Russian society? Uh, had they forgotten about you? Uh, did they know who you were? I guess, were they supportive of your case? I was, I was surprised that, uh, you know, Russian society, I'm kind of celebrity. Everybody knows me. Even I go to shopping mall or somewhere, everybody recognized me, you know, wishing me, you know, welcome back home, that they've been, you know, worried about me, supporting me. So uh, it's overwhelming. I'm very grateful for Russian people that, you know, they show that, uh, character and the support they're showing to me. It's overwhelming and I'm very glad to have that kind of reception here back home. Now, the, the person that was released in exchange for you, Brittany Griner, has come back and um, she's being used as a, uh, a showcase again for how bad Russia is, how unjust the Russian system of uh, justice is, how bad she was treated in prison and uh, designed uh, basically to use her story to turn the American public against, uh, against Russia. You have a tremendous justification not to like the United States. You have every right to hate Americans. Um, and maybe you do. But what is your feeling today about the United States? You went through this horrible experience. You witnessed firsthand the absolute lies and deceit of the American justice system, you were, you know, wrongfully denied 14 years, nine months of your life. Um, and now you're in Russia and you're taking a look at the state of relations between the United States and Russia. Do you want Russia to improve relations with America? Do you think America, Russia should have good relations with America? How do you feel about the United States? Well, let's split you know, this in two different categories. There is American people and there is an administration of a White House for pushing this policy on the people. I see the America right now that the American people are actually the guinea pig on which globalists trying to execute what they want to do all over the world. They're trying to destroy families. They're pushing up LGBTQ+, plus, whatever more pluses are coming. Uh, they're flooding the country with the uh, drugs. And you know, my experience was very interesting. All this time I spent with, uh, you know, Americans from rural, you know, uh, Southern Illinois, name it, you know, Missouri, uh, Tennessee, uh, Florida, Texas, all over the country. And I learned a lot from these people, how they live. We share a lot of experience, how we grow up. And guess what? We share it more in common that we have differences. I believe that the character of American people and character of Russian people has a lot of common which we can share. I don't see why we don't have, why we can't have a good relation. Look, traditionally, Russia was one country who helped United States to fight for independence and then several times supporting, sending even flotilla during Napoleon Wars to the United States to prevent attack and so on and so on. 
We've been allied during World War II, and now apparently Russia is evil, and you're trying to destroy us. I understand, you know, during Soviet time we have ideological differences, but right now, look, is a more capitalistic that I would say Europe, you know, we're less socialist than anybody else. Uh, it uh, has a good and bad sides too. But what really worries me now with this situation in Ukraine, and you did a lot of, uh, you know, good shows about what's going on in Ukraine, that this is a really slippery, you know, slope which leads us to the catastrophe. You know, initially, you know, we thought, hey, this special military operation will run and Russia want to solve it as like a family fall. Look, my, have a, my family has a family in Ukraine. You know, we all intermingled and intermixed. But think of this. What would American people will think if Russia one day will, you know, arm, train, let's say Mexico, and tell him, hey, you need to recapture the Texas. You need to recapture the Florida. You need to recapture New Mexico and California and Colorado because it used to be, for instance, you know, this one. And then, you know, we're going to supply them everything they need. You know, thousands of the Russian javelins, you know, many, many thousands of the Russian stingers. And finally, we're going to send the, you know, Russian C-400, 300, name it. Will your people like it? No. So the proxy war, sooner or later, we will we will go into the you know full contact kinetic war as your general says and where is the end of it and this is dangerous situation and then we you know people heal and the all consequences of decision of your politician will fall how we ends up in a you know nuclear exchange how we ends up up in else it's a big serious question but unfortunately you know, I don't see these days any anti-war movement in America much. You know, yeah, there is a couple of guys who are criticizing Zelensky, maybe you, maybe, you know, Tucker Carlson, maybe somebody else. But a part of that, it's like a silence. Everybody, yeah, everybody waving the Ukrainian flags. Yeah, let's go, let's go to the war. It looks like they are, you know, uh, rooting for some team which is a playing international, you know, whatever, you know, league of the football. But guess what? These dangerous games. And, you know, I wish, you know, that the people in America walk, uh, wake up as soon as, as soon as better and tell to their politician, hey, stop this madness. It will not end up. Russian people have decided to defend our interests and our people in Ukraine. Ukraine is artificial state. It shouldn't exist. And at this level and at this form, especially with the Nazism, what's happening Nazi now that the Nazism again reborn in Europe and Ukraine is their launch pad. Tomorrow, Germany is going to declare that Hitler is now a national hero, not a criminal anymore. Why? Because Bandera now legalized in Ukraine. And what is the difference? Tell me, what is the difference? And we and you, Americans, and the French and the British, we fought against that evil, you know, ideology. And now, apparently, we're fighting again. But this time, your government's on another side. They're supporting Nazi ideology. Where it will lead us again to the full, uh, full-blown World War Three? Rick, it's very dangerous situation, and I'm really concerned about this. And I don't see anywhere with this reaction of the politician of Europe. They like a sleepwalking to this war. Everybody talking like a talking head. Oh, let's go destroy Russia. Let's go destroy Russia. Yes, there is, was no in the history that anybody was able to destroy Russia. Yes, Napoleon went and took Moscow. But guess what? In one year, all his army was eliminated. And this is how this war will end. I'm sorry. I'm very, no, no, I'm very emotional. But try to understand me as a Russian person. You know, coming back home and understanding, I went to this, you know, freshly liberated territories of Lugansk and Zaporozhye territory, and I spoke to these people. I know what's going on from the first hand. I see what kind of the atrocities this Ukrainian neo-Nazis committing. And for me, it's very painful to see in your media all these people talking like they become a Nazi propaganda department for these people. 
and nobody really exposing them for what you are and your taxpayers money going to finance them the killing and shelling for past eight years how many kids in donbass was killed by these neo-nazis and now all shelling happening in donbass is by the you know ammunition supplied by the americans by the french by the germans and now they're saying yeah we're gonna send the patriots okay send the patriots or oh, we're gonna send them abrams tanks we're gonna send them leopard tanks okay you know we have anti-tanks you know weaponry we're gonna burn them but they it's what they want to fight to the last ukrainian nobody talks how many ukrainians really died there nobody even tried to see the tragedy of those ukrainians who are suffering under this regime because the for past eight years their security service anybody hope and any opinion was immediately put in upside or killed it's worse than it used to be during the Stalin regime and back in the soviet times first of all victor you don't have to apologize for getting emotional this is your country this is your history this is a tragedy that's taking place so you have every right to be emotional about this and uh i think it's important that people who are watching see your emotion you know so often the uh airwaves are full of people who uh speak calmly and they they speak as if there's no big problem everything's going to be calmed down no we need people like you to speak openly emotionally about this issue you've earned every right to speak emotionally so don't worry about it i i i appreciate and I support your emotion because it's it's much needed in this uh, this larger discussion. Um, you know, you um, you spoke earlier about the relationship you had with um, Americans who were incarcerated with you at uh, Marion. Uh, I just have a, 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 a simple question, I guess. Um, how did how did they treat you as a Russian, and what was their opinion of Russia? I mean, these are people that probably come from working class uh, backgrounds. Uh, did you find that they had been uh, propagandized uh, when they uh, initially met you? Did they have a certain opinion of you, what, what, you know, who you are, what Russia was? Or did you find that they had a realistic appreciation for you as a human being and for the Russian people as fellow human beings? It would be a surprise, but, you know, I've got a lot of interest from, you know, American from middle America. To find out what Russia is, and last, you know, maybe four or five years, majority of the guys was asking me how they can get to Russia. They said we're done with this country. We don't want anymore. We want to immigrate to Russia, and we really, and I really believe that the Russia offers now tremendous opportunity. With the all collapse of the normal society, with the normal family values, where the religion is still, you know, religion where the family is still family, where the school are not talking your kids how to, you know, practice, you know, anal and oral sex for, to the first graders. You know, Russia looks like a really attractive place to be. Yes, we have the problems here and there, but, you know, I found Russia tremendously improved with a first class infrastructure, with a Moscow, with a mass transit system. Yes, there is a problem. We've been under all kinds of the sanction. In fact, West now put on Russia more than 11,500 sanctions of all kinds. But look, still, our economy is functioning. In Moscow, any shopping mall or supermarket, you can find everything you dream of. It's all available. Yes, there is an inflation, but overall, I don't see any crisis or any you know, tension within the society. Moreover, Russian society now consolidated and fully supporting uh this you know war effort which going on and i by this you know past 40 45 days since my release i don't see anyone who would bring me privately that he don't support this mission they even more they're saying look we're frustrated why our you know army cannot hit them hard we need really to you know uh, step up efforts and really do it why we miss the opportunity on the beginning of this to bomb them to destroy this to destroy that and this is, you know, surprising to see this uh, this, this way. I, I just touch on uh, one last serious question, and then I, if you forgive me, I, I want to. I don't want to end with um, the, the 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 kind of um, tense emotion. So I, I want to ask two questions, uh, just as a personal level. But uh, the serious question touches on what you talked about. Um, 
you left Russia in 2008. Russia was eight years removed from the decade of the 1990s, which many people believe is one of the most horrible periods of Russian history since the Second World War, the, the period of Yeltsin, uh, the, 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 the economic collapse, etc. And so in 2008, you still had that. You, you returned in 2023. Um, we've been told in America that Vladimir Putin is the worst thing that ever happened to Russia. We've been told that the Russian government doesn't care about the Russian people, that uh, it's a corrupt government, that uh, the Russian people are suffering because of this government. From 2008 to 2023, what changes did you see in Russia? Did you see the same? Did you see improvement? Did you see it getting worse? What was your impression of Russia when you came home? It's like you're coming back to the future. I came back to the Russia of my dreams. Uh, you know, the country is changed beyond recognition. Moscow, especially the area where I live around, is changed so much I couldn't really recognize where I am. Highways, real good quality highway system with the toll roads, the free roads. Now you can drive, you know, on this road from Moscow to St. Petersburg to the south. Everything is a functional everywhere, modern, uh, high class, you know, service, gas station. City is a change beyond recognition. Moscow now having the biggest, uh, par, uh, biggest uh, uh, electrical buses fleet in the world. And they're buying them like crazy. The... I mean, you go to Moscow so clean even in the winter. Usually the winter in Moscow was miserable. This time I'm enjoying the, the, the Moscow. Look on the pictures how the Moscow look in the night now. Man, I myself sometimes, you know, just uh, overwhelmed with this, you know. Uh, it's like you're looking at this, you can't believe what they did to, to put so much lightning, so much, you know, all kind of the... Hap everything is happening. There is all kind of the... Uh, you know, Moscow government good for it, but as well as other cities. And, you know, despite uh, economical difficulties, you know, whenever I talk to my, you know, friends, my family, everybody has improvements in their life. Nobody tell me that life becomes intolerable or something. Yes, there is up and downs like anywhere in the world. Somebody is more successful, somebody less. And I understand that Russian government also time to time do you know mistake but at least they openly openly recognize them and trying to fix them it's good that uh, normal people can address their grievances and usually if you know these grievances gets you know proper attention they quickly fix yes we need to work on a lot of the issues but remember that russia for past hundred years at least three times Every like in history of my family and all of families of uh, Russian people, we've been lo losing everything at least four times: all property, all money. Nothing was really passed from generation to generation, and every time we start again, you know, accumulate something. And right now we have a literally somewhat peaceful period, maybe of 20, 25 years. And what we want to do, we just want to be left alone, not to be dis disturbed not to be, you know, uh, brought up into this, you know, war and develop our society. We need to pay attention. And we have a huge country. We have uh, so many opportunities for investment, for the work. Believe me, it's unbelievable what I'm seeing here and unbelievable how I'm feeling about future of the Russia. But before that, we need really to solve that problem. And I really wish that American people one of these days gonna you know take their proper decision and eventually sooner or later we have no other choice but have a good relation with america for the future of this planet without proper relation between russia and america there is never be any stability or peace in this planet and that's why i know that globalists will fail finally you know people who support a right you know uh case gonna win in america prevail and then russia will have a good relation from your lips to god's ears uh let's let's pray for that uh, that outcome now victor you have to forgive me the next two questions they're personal questions um You're you speak very good english 
and your uh, your bio suggests that you may have been t- uh, attended the uh, Moscow Institute of Foreign Languages. Did did you graduate from the Moscow Institute of Foreign Languages? I graduated from the uh, Moscow Military Institute of uh, you know Foreign Languages. Okay, because my, my wife graduated in 1988 from the uh, Moscow Institute of Foreign Languages, Maurice Therese, uh, and I was just wondering yeah, if you and she yeah. happened to be uh, classmates. Um, no, and then the, uh, was, the last... uh, she knows about it. We've been their military equivalent for Army. She, she knows about it. Yes, she, she does. Okay, and then uh, the last question, again, deals with my uh, wife, and please forgive this question, but... Um, Nicholas Cage is her favorite actor. What did you think of Nicholas Cage's uh, role in the movie? <laughs> honestly, uh, it's only movie survived because of, of Nicholas Cage there. Uh, if they would come and ask me, I would really suggest them way better script, way better story. Not so, you know, uh, you know, demonizing African or putting. I mean, it's really imagination. He has very little re- reality with Africa and retail reality what's going on in the world. But Nicholas Stage did an okay job. Look, it's always personal. I wish this never happened, but you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to be as an uh, you know observer of that, I would say he's a great actor, though he played a lot of the, because of his impersonation and uh, attachment of this you know, hero to my name served a lot of bad, you know, for me, for which I have to, you know, be punished because they already created the story. And it's easy then to convince the crowd, oh, yeah, this is a bad guy. That's only, you know, problem I have. Otherwise, well, you know, I wish everybody, you know, good luck and good health. You know, they have to answer before the God for what they did. And, and th- this is an important point. Now we're going to get back to being serious. Um, And this is how I'm going to close. You're a human being. And I hope through this discussion that we've had today that the audience recognizes you as a human being, a man with a family, with a life, with dreams, with visions, with hopes, with aspirations. And for 14 years and nine months, you were denied this by my government. Um, And one of the reasons why is because of propaganda. Because as we, we talked about the Nicolas Cage movie and how that was used against you, how... It, it wasn't about the real you, it was about the fake you. And you were used politically by my government to create an image of Russia that was negative. Um, and your name has become synonymous with, um, it, here in the United States, with, with bad things, with, with propaganda. The only way we're going to get out of this is to cut through the propaganda and get to the truth. And the truth of the matter is the man that I've spoken here today comes across as a good man an honorable man, a man who loves his country and a man who wants peace between his country and a nation that has done so much harm to him, my country. I thank you very much for being here today. I thank you for opening yourself up. I thank you for sharing your story. And most of all, I thank you for providing a vision of hope. Somebody in your position could be full of anger and bitterness and not wanting to have better relations with the United States, but you're sending the exact opposite message And for that, Victor, I thank you very much. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And that's the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope hope you learned something from this. I know I did. Um, We we got to see a different side of a very complicated story. And we got to see um, a human being who is uh, making his way back into life. And uh, despite all the obstacles that have been put in front of him, is somebody who is hoping for better relations between the United States, the American people, and Russia, the Russian people. That's really something we should all be aspiring to. Thank you much for tuning in, and remember, knowledge is power.